The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Tell Life Limited, ABN 7005 0109 450, AFSL 2378 48, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. My name is Sasha Lutkovsky and I'm a former insurance advisor of 15 years and CEO of The Sale Agency, a firm dedicated to helping advisors grow their businesses. This series is all about insurance, exploring the start to end process of putting a policy in place all the way through to claim time. I'm joined by five experts who share their knowledge and insights and a few stories along the way. So let's get started. This podcast series is brought to you by leading Australian life insurer, TAL. TAL is committed to partnering with advisors to protect the financial well-being of their clients, now and into the future. TAL's accelerated protection products ensure your clients have access to cover options that are suited to their individual needs. Last financial year, TAL paid $3.5 billion in claims to over 45,000 customers. Persons deciding whether to acquire or continue to hold life insurance issued by TAL should consider the relevant product disclosure statement. The target market determination for the product is also available online at tal.com.au. Welcome to the first in our series of podcasts focusing on insurance. My guest today is Anita Muke, and we're going to be talking today about setting an insurance policy up for success. Now, Anita, this is her 30th year in the insurance profession. So, Anita, Tell me a little bit about your business and why insurance? Why do you keep coming back year after year to insurance? Hey, Sasha. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Um, so why insurance? Um, the short answer is I, I returned home from Germany after a few years living over there and I was married and I, I needed to do some more study and um while I was waiting for the academic year to start, I went and worked with my father, who was a life risk insurance advisor. And he has been in the game forever. He's retired about um, oh, 15, 20 years ago now. And yeah, so uh, just over the summer, I was sort of filling in time and went to work for dad and never really left. That's a uh, that's a very familiar story. Uh, that's just going to say that and not alone in that. Like you often hear of um, kids, people going into their parents' um, life businesses. It's really funny. Yeah, well, that's 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 how I got started in life insurance as well. So why why insurance though? Because you know we've got holistic advisors, we've got specialist risk advisors. What is it that keeps you coming back to insurance? I think when I first started, I didn't have a clear, like as clear a um, conception of why insurance is so critical. Um, over the years, though, that, that has really um, grown. You know, my sense of it being such an important part of financial planning, and I guess that's what you know, it being so important is what's kept me in the business. Um, I'm not drawn to investment advice and looking after people's money, uh, but I do. I find it really easy to have those really difficult or what other people think are, you know, difficult conversations about, you know, what what would actually happen if if something happened to you? What what would that look like? And I'm I'm quite cool with those difficult conversations. So I guess it just stuck. I it turned out that I was good at it, and and so I just um, I kept doing it. Yeah, and look, it's an important point that that we've raised about difficult conversations, and I guess that's a really important part of setting a policy up for success. So, I've had a lot of advisors doing their professional year and advisors looking to get into insurance who ask me, you know, what are some of the ways that we can address these insurance needs early on in the fact finding process? So, are there any sort of questions or processes that you have implemented in your business that can help 
you know, focus or direct that information towards an insurance outcome, medical type things, anything like that that you've implemented that you've found a success with? Well, not really, Sasha, because the sole focus of my business is life insurance. I don't have to sort of construct the conversation to direct the client towards insurance. Mm -hmm. They've already come to me for insurance Mm -hmm. or insurance review and they've got insurance. So either way, it's already the sole focus. I think the biggest thing, to be honest, um, and I was thinking about this yesterday when I knew we were going to be talking, the biggest thing that advisors or other advisors who want to do better at risk need to do is get themselves more comfortable with those conversations and just come to terms with the fact that if they're not talking about insurance, they're not, and they're not, and they're calling themselves, you know, full service advisors and they're leaving out insurance or just glossing over it, they're not doing their clients a favours, any favours. Um, yeah, that's that's what I would say is that they're not comfortable with it so they don't do it. They tend to focus on the client's other needs, which are super important as well and obviously need to be addressed by someone. But if I'm not being a professional and being an expert in insurance, then I'm not helping my client. Mm. And part of the job, if something goes wrong, they're going to kick themselves you know, if the client has this fantastic financial plan and they didn't take up the insurance because you didn't really push it or didn't bring it up, they're going to kick themselves if something goes wrong, you know? Yeah, look, and I think inherently insurance and and protection strategies absolutely underpin an overall financial plan. In my personal opinion, uh, you can have the best investment strategies, the best wealth building strategies in the land, but if something does go wrong and you don't have the protection pillar underpinning that, well, then it all it all falls down. So, you know, they, they really do go hand in hand. And I guess, you know, that is why we're talking about these sorts of things today is to help advisors get more comfortable with these conversations. So when we talk about these uncomfortable conversations and you know, insurance traditionally being viewed as uncool, not sexy, that sort of thing. What strategies, What? how have you overcome that? I mean, we're obviously a bit biased because we love insurance, but how, how do you address that either, you know, in your business with your clients? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, Sasha. So I know when I first started that Um, The way that I I did, I had two prongs when I first started and one was cold calling and I tried to replicate sort of what my father did, which was simply cold calling and he'd walk into a business premises, mostly business premises, and just say, now, who's looking after your insurance and how much are you paying? And that that sort of got the conversation started. So I did sort of do that, but in my own way, I wasn't as brazen as he was. Um, but I did a pro- I did do cold calling and it did work. It does work. It's a numbers game, but of course we can't do that anymore. But um, uh, the other thing I did that worked really well for me was networking. So um, networking lunches mostly with um, other women in business, and following that, um, I would write the women that I'd actually met. Not everybody, just the ones who I'd met and had a brief discussion with, and I'd write to them afterwards and say, "Hey, this is what I do. I really value." Um, some time with you if you've got insurance um, you know I might be able to um, get a better price or even better cover than what you have now and if you don't have insurance it'd be really lovely to maybe have a catch-up and a coffee and and just go over it and because it was a letter um, you know it was less awkward and you know I don't think there's anything wrong with receiving a letter now after a networking meeting I would be quite happy to receive something in the post after a networking meeting um, and then after the after about a week, I'd follow up and say, "Hey, did you get my letter? Um, yeah, what did you think? Have you actually got insurance, or is this a good time to talk? And then have you have you actually already got insurance, or oh, you haven't? Is it something you've thought of?" And that's, they say, "No, no, we haven't thought of it. No, we don't really want it." I say, "That's fine. I appreciate that. That's absolutely fine. Well, thanks anyway for your time. And look, can you keep me in mind if?" Um, you know, if it does come up and you suddenly think we should have really done something about that. I did become a lot more comfortable over time discussing insurance and now I'm, I absolutely have no scruples whatsoever. Like I've just seen it so many times. People wish they'd done it, people who did do it and claim, people who wished they'd done it, people who wished they'd had more. 
all of that. I've seen it all now and now I just, I don't beat around the bush. You know, I, I pretty much only talk to people who want insurance now. So Yeah, and look, I think that's an important point as well when we talk about, A, first of all, just referencing what, what you were saying about how you, you know, got business early on in those, you know, different times when you, you know, post a physical letter. Regardless of how technology's changed, I don't think necessarily that, you know, lead sourcing has changed. The networking is still applicable. Following up with an email or a text or a letter, whatever it is, the fundamentals of 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 acquiring leads, except for cold calling, of course, uh, hasn't necessarily changed. It's just the technology around it has. So I think that that's a really good, you know, tip for for advisors. Um, you know, insurance isn't necessarily scary. It's not revolutionary in the way that you know we source business, we talk to clients, that sort of thing. So. Now you're getting clients sort of through the door. So what systems, what processes do you have in your business? Because we're talking about setting a policy up for success. So, you know, when a client first comes through your door to when they actually become a client, what things, what measures do you have in place? What processes might you have in place to make sure that things like reassessments, you know, medical issues don't become an unforeseen problem, things like that. What what do you do in your business around that? Yeah, so in the fact-finding phase uh, with the pre-assessments, I do do a rough pre-assessment just off the top of my head when I, initially when I just first talked to a client. So I basically ask them if they're on any medication and their height and weight and if there's any other um, medical things that they could tell me about. I don't do a full pre-assessment, although, oh, look, I've been meaning to implement that for some time and I get caught out more and more frequently with, you know, people saying they haven't had anything and they've, they're, their understanding of haven't had anything is really vague and, you know, it turns out they've had things that really affect their insurability significantly. So it, I think it's something that I, I, I haven't done adequately um, in the past and that I should I should implement and that would simply be in the fact finding stage just um saying to people look it um in my experience it just saves a ton of time if we can just run through these health questions now because that way i can actually tell you what i can get for you and what the cost will be rather than us going through a, pro- a pro- process of here's the price and then afterwards i find out you know that three people in your family have cancer and um, you're a heavy smoker and, you know, all those other things. And I can find that out and, and give you a much more accurate idea of what it's going to cost and what insurance I can get for you. It'll save you time and it'll save me time and and thus money. So I think I was just going to say, I think it's quite interesting when I speak with more holistic advisors, one of the things that, you know, they often find quite confronting, not always, is the medical side of things. It's a very personal thing to discuss. As we know, we gather so much information about clients, but it's often very black and white, very tangible, very numbers focused. A lot of people understand that when they come to seek financial advice. But I do find advisors, newer advisors doing their professional year or advisors who aren't used to risk, uh, being quite intimidated by the medical side of things. So I was going to actually take a step back and say, obviously, you know, we're doing the fact find. Is that your first conversation with the client? Because to raise those sorts of things during the first conversation can be very confronting for both advisor and client. So where are you talking about these medical type things? So the first thing is, I think it does come back to confidence again. The advisor needs to view themselves as a professional and they have to be comfortable asking those questions because that's intimately related with procuring life insurance for the client. So if you're not comfortable you know, naming parts of the anatomy, then um, you've got to get yourself comfortable with it. You've got to practice talking on about that with your partner, interviewing them, asking the question. Um, I actually had a similar discussion with Emily um, last year or the year before about um, the, this very thing. When I bring it up is right at the beginning. Yes, if you're asking for pre-assessment, absolutely. Um, you don't get into something really intimate straight away. The client leads you to it. Um, yes, I had cancer. Oh, okay. Now, what sort of cancer was that? Um, well, I had a lump. Okay, yep. Thank you for letting me know. Now, where was the lump? Um, actually, it was in my um, testicle. 
okay, yep, no, that's fine. Did you get a grading at all for that? You just go on. And you can't be afraid. You can't go, oh, okay, well, we'll just leave that because I'm really scared to ask where the lump was or he sent testicle. I don't want to go any further because I don't want to say testicle. You've got to just be comfortable with it. Did you get the grading? Um, was it just a lumpectomy or did you have to have the testicle removed? Like you've, you've just got to um, be um, confident you know, I mean, if you're going to your doctor to um, that, they don't chicken out and not want to say the words. So it's a, it's part of your job to find out all of that information and then present it. Otherwise, you're just wasting their time, or wasting your own time, and wasting the underwriter's time because you could like weed out something that's never going to get through. You're not going to get anything for this client, you know, unless or you you want the best terms for them. If you find out everything up front, including now saying to them after you've found out that information, for instance, listen, in my experience, the best thing I can ask for is actually the histology. Would you have that in a drawer somewhere, a copy of that histology? Or would you have your discharge papers for that surgery? Because that'll tell you, you know, what, what you need to know. And then you can pass that on to the, to the underwriter for pre-assessment. And you tell the client, obviously, listen, I'm going to share this with a panel of insurers to see who offers you the best possible terms. I think it's a really important point you raise there about the confidence factor because, and this is something that, you know, we'll explore in one of the other podcasts in this series all about claims. Um, but when I was advising, when someone would call up to make a claim, of course, you had the empathy, the care, all of that is there because there's my client and I care deeply about what's happened to them. But they're also coming to me because they want stuff to happen. They want to tell me the facts and they want to get on with their claim. They don't want me to sit there and cry with them necessarily. Sometimes they did, of course, yeah. and that, that was an option. Yeah. But I yeah. think that comes back to that confidence thing that people, clients are coming to us expecting us to be professionals and we've just got to you know, be confident with, with those, um, especially medical things. Um, and also how we learn about these medical things. I don't know about yourself. I've often got friends of mine who work outside this profession who are astounded with the amount of medical information that I have learned over the course of my career. Yeah, exactly. And the reality is that if you're getting in, into risk, if you're starting in risk, you have to start somewhere. So you do pick things up as you go. Speak with underwriters. Is there any other tips that you can um, share on how to improve things around medical knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. So when I'm talking to the client, if they mention something that I'm not familiar with, I'd say, oh, now, look, I'm a financial planner. I'm not a doctor. Would you mind just um, spelling that one for me? Right, right. And look, if it's not too sensitive, could you describe that for me? Oh, right. And then and then you're off. And then while you're doing that, of course, Google it as well the, at the same time that you're talking to the client, if you can. If you're on your phone and you're not in your office, you, you might not have a screen nearby, but if you've got a screen... Google it at the same time, and that way you're looking it up at the same time. Oh, okay, I can see. Yes, it's the this and that. Right, right. And then also straight away you know, okay, that's related to coronary style for, right, that's a that's a this or that. Oh, that's like MS but not MS sort of, you know, you, and you learn. And you do learn. You're right. It's amazing how much general sort of knowledge you, you have about that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah so that's my tip there is to um, have a screen and quickly Google it. And also just say to the client, that is, look, um, I'm really, I'm really sorry. Thank and also just thank them for sharing and thank them for being frank with you and not, you know, and like I think that engenders um respect. So if you just oh thank you for sharing that. And sometimes if you don't, if you haven't had it before, you won't know the specific questions that the underwriter wants to know. So what you say then is, look, I'll just ask the underwriters directly they're the people that decide on what terms they're going to offer you cover i'm going to ask them what specific things about your condition that they'd like to know and then i'll get back to you you know because sometimes you know they might say you know i've got high cholesterol that's great i know what to ask what's your reading or you know if they've got diabetes is it type one or type two what was your latest hba1c when did you have your last blood test etc cetera, etc cetera. so i know all of that but if it's something you're not familiar with you have to get in touch with the underwriters first and say to them, what specifically do you need to know in order to um, get cover for this? And they'll tell you, we need to know, you know, when was there this test and all sorts of stuff. 
you raised there this concept of engendering trust and respect and that's not something that any of us in any of our financial advice roles ever overlook. It's, it is, of course, vital to get the trust of your client and, and their respect. And raising these medical type questions and often quite invasive medical questions uh, can, can be very confronting for both parties. But I think you've given a lot of good tips there for advisors. Can I interrupt you? It's not invasive. So if you say invasive, if you say that to a young financial planner, they might feel, oh, yes, it's invasive. I'm invading their privacy. It's not really. It's intimate. It's an intimate sharing, but it's not invasive. It's not like you, they, the client, you don't want the advisor to feel like they are being invasive because it's not. It's just doing your job. So they wait to turn it down and just go to themselves, I'm just doing my job. I'm just doing my job. I'm good at my job. I'm going to ask the questions about whatever body part the person is asking about. You know, I'm not going to back away from it. I'm going to be professional. I'm going to say the words. You've got to use the correct anatomical word and like learn the terms. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, sorry. I just thought I'd interrupt there. No, of course. No, it's, it's all, you're right. You are right. Um, so, look, I think we're talking about asking questions and a lot of advisors find insurance applications overwhelming. Regardless of whether it's medical questions, of course, that makes up the bulk of an insurance application. But what do you do in your business to make completing an insurance application as smooth as possible? Do you do it in-house? Do you outsource that to the insurer? How do you complete your insurance applications? I always do them myself. And the reason is that I think can then control not the outcome, but I can pre-underwrite the client. So if something comes up that I hadn't asked about or they hadn't mentioned before, um, I can pre-warn them of the outcome. So I can say, hey, you know how you just mentioned about that? Well, e.g. E a sore lower back. Um, look, if you've had anything in the last two years, in my experience, they're going to offer you a lower back exclusion for income protection and permanent disability. So that's very standard. I just want to let you know that the reason they do that is it's a huge area of claims and there's no black and white test for a sore back. It doesn't come under a microscope and you can't see it. So it's a big area of claims and I just want to let you know that's the likely outcome. And and if you say it at that point, um, it just you, you're almost telling them, look, no big drama, this is the outcome. This is what the outcome is going to be. And by the time it comes through, they just they just sign it as a matter of course. It's not, oh, do you still want the cover? No, no, no. It's, yeah, they already knew that was coming because I mentioned it. I stopped it as soon as they said sore lower back. I stopped them and said, you can't get cover for something that you've already got. So, yeah, setting expectations with clients yeah. around those sorts of things makes the process so much easier so much smoother for everyone and the, again the clients respect that they know that you know your stuff yes exactly and i think so, um, other than that um a good internet connection there's nothing more frustrating than you know your internet falling in and out when you're doing an online application i don't do any paper applications at all i'm not sure that anyone does anymore but certainly the online applications you can't miss a question um a good internet connection and look i find it that I, I, I sometimes do, I start the application without the client, so I'll do the name, address, title, a contact details, and then when I've got the client online, I'll go back to the disclosure part and go through the disclosure with them and then on to the personal statement, which is the health questions and occupation questions. But I might feel in things like who they work for, their contact details, you know, the residential address, all that sort of stuff. I might do that beforehand just to save time. And I also tell them up front how long it's going to take. So, and if it's taking too long, I say to them, look, if we've taken too long or if, you know, halfway through, hey, look, if, you know, if you can hear, hear the kids crying in the background or when you can hear whatever happening in the background, you can always just say, look, do you want to leave it and we can take up, take this up again in the morning or, you know, you can contact me tomorrow. We can finish it then so offer the clients a chance to um you know complete it later if if possible if they'd like to so just sort of be aware being empathetic and um 
yeah. Other than that, just follow the process, you know, through you can't you can't really make any mistakes once you're in the system. Yeah. So this is always a potential I wouldn't say minefield. I will just say it always you know, it's, a, it's a difficult one to answer. And so I just want to preface that. What happens for you when you feel a client may not be disclosing something or a client wants to discuss whether they should disclose something with you? How how do you obviously every case is individual, but how how do you broach that? Yeah, so um I there's that's two different questions. So if I feel a client isn't being honest with me for whatever reason, it's just a feeling or something they've said, and I have had those situations, um, I make sure that I do the disclosure super diligently. And I also emphasize in my, you know, in plain English, um, that, you know, why, you know, you wouldn't be bothered paying for insurance if at claim time they're not gonna pay it because you haven't told them something. Sometimes if um, I'm nervous, I might get them to sign that disclosure page separately, just put it in with the authority to proceed and get a signature on it. Uh, I will file notice if I feel. Um, The other thing I do with my existing clients and even um, new clients is I'll get copies of their previous applications and often I'll say, now with with your back in that, 10 years ago application it said this so I'll just pop that in hang on a minute back da, da, da. that's the time where you fell over and you had to have the six months of physio and I'll just pop that in so that's a yes so yeah I just they're talking there and you know we're having an interview but meanwhile I've got my my other stuff open from whatever I've got handy uh, you know I'll look up on explain what I can see what I've got filed and and have that open while we're doing the application so nothing gets missed. So sometimes it's just a case of me reminding them what we've what we've said in the past. Yeah, I think that's yeah, so the ones that you're not quite sure whether they are telling you the truth, I generally just say, you know, let's let's make sure you have the best chance of claiming by, you know, it's really important and it's unfair to the other policyholders if you don't disclose everything because they are making a, a decision based on what you tell them. So it's only fair that you tell them, you know, everything. Mm. Even if, I say, even if you think it's insignificant, still important that you mention everything that I ask you. So I put it into my own words. Yeah, I think it's an excellent tip regarding existing clients and previous applications. Uh, we used to do something very similar, of course, Put in everything from previous applications. Just even if it's if it's an increase, remind the underwriter what has been included on the application or, previously, or just send the underwriter the previous application. Just double check with the client that that's okay, privacy wise, and send the new underwriter the old app. That way, they have the history as well. Yeah. So we've submitted an insurance application for a client. It's now going through to the underwriter. What do you do to push that along, both from the underwriter side of things, managing that expectation and also managing the client expectations and getting the clients to potentially do their medical tests, getting them to return paperwork. What do you do to push that along? Yeah. Um, look, I don't have any difficulty at all with the client, so, and not really any with the underwriters either. So with from the client's perspective, um, you know, I just email them um, an update saying, look, this is where we're at. They've written to your doctor. Um, through a third-party company that chases up doctors and that'll come in in due course. If it doesn't, I'll maybe ring the client and say, look, could you, these doctors, they've run off their feet. Would you be able to give your GP a call and just say we've been waiting, you know, for more than the recommended amount of time to get a report? It might just make the difference if you call them and say you're waiting on insurance. So, yeah, the clients are pretty usually pretty happy to do that. From the underwriter's perspective... Yeah, I'll be in touch with the underwriters all the time. I mean, they have, you know, their deadlines and service standards and, you know, everything. Generally, they're working as hard as they can. So that's generally not an issue. Um, Some of the third-party companies that do the chasing up, I find really hard to deal with. Um, Not the pathology ones that send out the nurses, but the ones where they, you know, check up the, um, the personal medical attendance reports. I find them incredibly hard to deal with and often I'll rig up and, you know, 
or I'll log on. You've got to be on their back, honestly. I'll log on and it'll say, Mary spoke to the doctors, the manager of the practice on Monday and um, she's going to call again on Wednesday. And then on Wednesday, nothing happens and I'll ring the practice and um, I'll, and the practice is closed on Wednesday or I'll Google, I'll Google this practice, Google, oh, the practice is closed on Wednesday. That's why nothing happened. So they are, they are slack. Yeah, so if it gets to them, I um, I take over and push, push, push. All right, so we are nearing the end of our time together, Anita. So I'm going to put you on the spot and say if you could give one tip to someone who is looking to grow their insurance business, what would it be? Well, probably a combination of two things. You have to be really comfortable talking about insurance and really believe in it. Insurance is, you know, and, and start building your own personal justification for personal insurance. You know, I, I like the comparison with um, insuring your car, not so much your house because that's a big asset, but your car, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't drive around with just the back left-hand passenger door insured, you know, and you've got the bumper, front bumper, the back, you've got the whole car insured. And, you know, your vehicle is, is nothing compared to your income and your and your ability to earn that income each year and, you know, that income that's going towards the kids' education and your mortgage and um, or your business or whatever. So I think they need to build their own really internalised sense of um, importance of insurance so that they've got that inner confidence to talk to clients and, and also withstand the client's... Um, reticence or um, hesitation about insurance and like be the professional and be be the person that is happy to argue with the client but be professional and say well you know I think it's really really important actually like to be honest and you know to sort of answer back and not not be uncomfortable yourself and then the client is uncomfortable and it just gets brushed under the carpet so I, I think that would be it and try and put yourself in the client's shoes. If if the person you're sitting in front of today, if it's a young graduate or or um, you know somebody mid career, what if that person had um, a traumatic event or a stroke or a car accident? You know, how's their life going to look without insurance? Yeah. So um, and you know, get comfortable with telling the clients that you really think that they should be seriously considering insurance properly. Yeah. Great. No, that's excellent. So Anita, thank you so much for your time today. I do hope you enjoyed being on the podcast and Absolutely. can our listeners connect with you on LinkedIn if they... Absolutely. Okay, yeah, that's because I, I'd be delighted if um, somebody, and if somebody wants to, you know, if somebody has a query or or something that they'd like to have a chat. I'd be really happy to talk to someone who's struggling with insurance. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that offer. Uh, you can find Anita on LinkedIn. Her details will be in the show notes. Anita, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for listening and be sure to listen to the rest of our series on insurance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Sasha.